Dragon Con next week when we try and be sober and straight while not being sober. Hi. Straight, what? Hi, welcome. Hi. We're live. We are. So this is this is gonna be on Wednesday, but I promise they're they're not day drinking. Okay, they are day drinking, but it's on a Sunday, so God forgives them. It's yeah, it's with Sunday totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so hey, all you crazy sci fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, sky is the limit, and space is the place. So, what are you going to do? We have the one, the only, the sober Miss Marissa Wolf. I am still sober. I've only drank that much so far, y'all. I'm ready. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I know. Hey, well, in the background. And then in the background, it. it and my and husband. <laughs> my husband. Wait, that sounded wrong. Back that up. We'll, we'll edit that out, I'm sure. Sounded exactly right, JR. You know what? Her husband is worth saying hi, husband, too. He is pretty right. I know. Pretty Somebody awesome. has to be married here. I mean, at least one of them is okay. Ouch. I feel attacked. All right. So uh, this is the part of the introduction, dear listener and viewer, if you're over there in YouTube land, uh, where we tell us, uh, Mel tells us a little bit about herself. Because you haven't been on since we rebranded. I have not. No. Mm. This is my first time. She said, without making a joke. <laughs> it's going to be one of those shows. Yep. Let's see if you can beat Casey, because she's the only episode we've done where we actually had to mark it as NSFW. You know what? I don't need to beat her. She is, she's in a league of her own, as always. But we are going to have <laughs> our own. We put her in she right. She's amazing. That's right. She's above us. Um, we're just going to have a good time. All right. So tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, yeah, I am Maurice Wolf. I am a science fiction and fantasy author. I am a giant nerd, as I have been since I was born. Um, second generation nerd. My dad trained me well. That's why I have purple hair. You can kind of tell it's purple. That's fine. Um, I am one of the core authors in the best selling Four Horsemen universe. Um, I've been writing in a couple of other folks' universes. Um, and the next year or so, I'll have my own books out. Um, yay, very exciting. Um, and I counted the other day for this podcast, and they have 21 short stories out. Wow. Across five different wait, publishing houses. Wait, so. wait, this is an important question. Does Mark know you're cheating on him? <laughs> Does Mark actually expect monogamy? I, I'm not I a monogamous know. writer, friends. I, I play the field. <laughs> I'm married in the real life, but in the writing world... <laughs> I can be had for the cost of a contract. A nice royalty check. Mm-hmm. A very nice royalty check. Okay, that's good to know. So how cheap are you? Is it a bourbon? Is it a margarita made by Mel? Like, what can the author community, like, bribe you with? Yeah, there's a range for sure. Um, I would say a Mel margarita is way up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, top class. Dragon Con panels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I prefer... I prefer, you know, percentage of the profits over an advance that may never get paid out, but you know, we can deal. See. All right, so you heard it here first, people. All right, so now we get to say how we first found them. Um, so Saska, I I'm gonna make mine easy because I met you, Marissa, through your our friend Casey, mm-hmm. uh, and we had her on the podcast, and she's like, no, if we're gonna talk about my book, I have to drag my friend along, and she said, but you'll like her because she got hit in the head with an alligator, and I'm like, dude, sign me up. I so. Did. Headbutted. To, to be headbutted. technical, I was headbutted by an alligator. Before Seska tells us how she met you, can you tell us that story real quick in case they didn't listen to that interview on Sci Fi Channel? Oh, yes. Sure. I would love that. So, way back in the depths of the early 2000s when I was a teacher, um, my baby brother was very young and he did the Flat Stanley Project. I don't know if folks are familiar with that, but you like mail this little paper boy and take pictures with him for class projects. Doesn't matter. I decided, what do second graders like? I live in Louisiana, they're in Connecticut, alligators. So I called this swamp tour and I asked, you know, do you, do you guys like, I need to come take a picture with an alligator? Like, "Mm, yeah, well, no, we don't do that. And I was like, oh, I'm doing this Flat Stanley project for my brother. And the girl's like, oh my God, Flat Stanley. I love Flat Stanley. Yeah, 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 come down. We have a tour, it ends at this time, come in. I was like, cool. So here I am, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a Yankee in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I go up to the boat and the guy's like, oh, hey, you're here for the picture with the alligator? And I was like, yep. He's like, cool. The rose an alligator at me. So step the first mistake that I made was I caught the alligator rather than take a step back saying, why the fuck are you throwing an alligator at me? <laughs> um, so I, I, cut, I, I catch the alligator and I'm, I'm gripping the alligator pretty hard. Um, not a euphemism, just really holding that alligator. Um, and it's like, you know, three feet long, a whole foot of it is the tail, but it, it's an alligator in my hands. And I was like, okay, 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 okay. Surely its mouth is taped 
surely it's safe that I'm holding an alligator. Why else would he casually throw an alligator to me that I've caught like a moron? <laughs> um, and so I, I, I gently loosen my grip slightly and the alligator immediately senses my weakness and is like, ha, sucker, and just rears back and slams his bony stupid head into my not as bony stupid head. Um, and I was like, holy Jesus. So I'm still holding the alligator. Still, I have not thrown the alligator to the ground, which is pretty stupid. Um, and I'm like, can you please take the picture? Thanks. So in the picture, like my hair is like here, my sunglasses are half off my head. I don't even think it's really a smile. I'm gripping the alligator. Flat Stanley is crumpled in the back, like me. Um, and then that's how I was head better by alligator. I bled a little bit, but I don't have a scar. It's fine. That's Chick my story. Scars, though. Chick stick scars. They they swear that to me. All right. Uh, how did you first find the one, the only Mel there, Mar Doc? Marisa. Marisa. We're at Mel's house. We're at Mel's house. <laughs> I I can't even blame the bourbon yet. So yeah. um, we're all day drinking here, guys. It's gonna be an interesting show. <laughs> um, <laughs> we do what we do. Uh, I actually met you through Casey Essel. Yeah. We were at Liberty Con. Mm -hmm. Liberty Con. And I'm I was there and I and Casey's like, here, this is Marisa. You need to meet her. And I'm like, okay. Wait, no. Hi. No, no, was it? No, I'm pretty sure it was Griffin. Oh, it was Griffin. You met Casey and I at the same time. No, no, I knew Casey. You knew Casey? I knew oh, Casey okay. already. Okay. No, it was okay. Griffin who dragged you over there. Yeah, Griffin yeah. Barber, who we've had on. He's great. And um, and it was like you need to meet Marissa. She's Casey's writing partner. Pretty great. And and yes, the headbutting of an alligator was immediately brought up. I don't know why. It's apparently my uh. <clears throat> Clint you catch fans. dangerous predators. Why in your would hands. I catch, you? You don't. You hands up. Don't catch. But no, not me. One would think you don't toss them either. But you know, it's Louisiana. What are you gonna do? Remember, uh, rem remind me. We need to tell Jennifer Blackstream this story at Dragon Con <laughs> because she has pictures of alligator oh. uh, privates. So, have you written a alligator headbutting scene yet? I mean, you've got the four horsemen. It's kind of perfect for it. Not yet. How could you no. not? Her have writing done that? career is young. <laughs> That's true. Robust, but young. <laughs> it's true. We're only three. Very years fluid. In. Very fluid. <laughs> Genre fluid, so, if you will. Yeah, I, I've heard. I've heard. You basically have like Project ADHD. Uh, yeah, I do. It's fine. I like all the things, and I just want to write no all the things. No limitations. That's right. You could stop at any time. Okay. No. No, she can't. I cannot. So, if you had to pick one, which one would you pick? Planet of the Apes, 2001, A Space Odyssey, or Mars Attacks? I'm afraid I can't answer that, Dave. No. Oh. And I have to go 2001. Okay. Space Odyssey. I got so, it. I see what you're doing there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm picking up what you're laying down. I'm pretty clever over here. Somebody's got to clean up the mess. <laughs> wow. I only no drink comment. that much. I'm much further along than you already. That's what she said. I'm catching up. Um, okay, so yes, Excalibur, Willow, or Legend? So I got a sneak peek at these questions, y'all. Spoilers. Um, and it's Willow, but it made me realize I haven't watched it since I, I think it was like nine or ten. I have to watch it again. Yeah, you should watch important. it again. Yeah, that feels very important. So. We should do that after con. <laughs> yes, we should. Maybe we could do a review episode of Willow. We'll bring it back. That's got Val Kilmer in it. I do like me some so Val Kilmer. A young Val Kilmer, too. He's Very such pretty. a pretty guy. Pretty it's a legendary storytelling. It's got a sword fighter, the legendary sword fighter, who I don't think has a sword the whole dang movie. <laughs> Fair. So That's like Chekhov's gun. They put it there, and then they never fired it. Right, and then you never get to watch. Which was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy? Shoot. So probably fantasy, because I read Narnia when I was like seven. I think that really sank in. But I'm gonna actually cheat and say space fantasy because it was Star Wars first. Okay. So, cause my dad, so Star Wars came out, the first Star Wars came out like a year before I was born. My dad saw it opening night. Like my dad is like a nerd nerd, thank goodness. Um, so I was raised correctly. And um, <laughs> so I, I mean, Han Solo is my first crush. Like Star Wars was my jam and then Star Trek and Narnia, and then Anne McCaffrey, which, of course, yeah. love her. So wonderful. Yes, the answer is yes. Nebula. Amazing woman. Mm, she's amazing. So my which first is love for sci-fi. Yes. So stop it, Jr. 
Oh, wait, are you guys the sci-fi fantasy battle? Is that what you do? No, he, he likes to say that if it has anything with wings, it has to be fantasy. No, not anything with wings, just dragons. Dragons are not fantasy necessarily. Okay. Challenge accepted. So if uh, Mad Mardigan and uh, Ania, Anigo Montoya, who I'm probably butchering his name, they got in a sword fight, who's going to win? That's Princess Mad Bride versus Willow. I think Inigo Montoya. Well, it depends, Willow. I guess. Is he powered by Willow? Is it when his we, father? <laughs> is it the man who killed his father? Shit. Ooh, that's a good question. Or the Black <laughs> Dread Pirate. Dread what? Pirate Black Roberts. Dread Pirate or Roberts. Dread, yeah, Dread Pirate Roberts. There we go. We're going full nerd right here. Yes. Like 1980s nerds. Yeah, that's the point of this, right? That's what we do here. Yeah. yeah. Do we get brownie points for that? Somebody say we get brownie points. Yes. I don't know. We get margarita points. I get margarita points. I don't know what you get. He gets Jack and Coke points. I get Jack and Coke <laughs> points. All right. So what was your first memory of speculative fiction then? Was it a uh, video game, RPG, card game? How did you discover speculative fiction writ large? I mean, it was probably Star Wars again or Star Trek. Um, but... Not to like segue us in front. I think the very first RPG game I ever played was Starflight. Okay. Which was a computer RPG game. Huh. It's almost yeah. like we set that one up perfectly. So weird how that works. Oh no. So what is it about? Why do I think we plan things? No, we don't. It's just happy coincidence. But uh, so what is it you love about speculative fiction as a genre? Oh man, it's the what if. Like, I mean, I think there's some really cool things about our world. There's a lot of really shitty things about our world and the what if of it, like being able to play it out and think about, okay, what happens if we keep doing this or if we stop doing this or if we find aliens or if we discover cold fusion or whatever it is, what happens? And then what do we do? And then what does that mean for people? Gravity that, generators. Right? We have real artificial Then, then, then Mark Wandry gets very pissy with us and we are very happy. What if they're powered by any matter? <laughs> It'll be if, we, if we have like anti-gravity created, I really hope they call it the Mark Wandry. Uh, yes. Oh my God. He would love it so much. That'd be, I just, uh, just to rub it in his face. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, like, like, that? Like, like, who's that Mark Wandry guy? Why, did he invent it? No, he just hated it. No, he hates it. He hates it so much. <laughs> it, it is actually quite funny. And it's powered by antimatter. Now we know. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> how, did, <laughs> how did your love of speculative fiction transition into you writing stories? Oh, man. Wow. I mean, I've been writing since I was six. Um, and this is not an exaggeration. I found my first laminated short story. Um, it was about, I've told people this before, but I still can't get over six-year-old Marisa. It was about Idaho potatoes. I don't know why. Like, to be clear, I'm not from Idaho. I do love potatoes, but and they are all from Idaho. They're apparently all from Idaho. So <laughs> I was obsessed. I don't know. I wrote a story about this girl and her dog and Idaho potatoes. It was a mystery. I don't know. Um, the potatoes talk, though, so it was science fiction. Anyway, so. Um, or is so it I've fantasy? Always, I've always been a writer. I mean, you <laughs> watched too much Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> Probably. I think it was Clifford the Big Red Dog. He said the giant dog, and then I, so I had giant potatoes so that it wasn't a ripoff. So um, maybe that's why my potatoes aren't growing. It's because I'm not in Idaho. See, if you move to Idaho, you will have enormous potatoes. That's just facts. Science. 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 All right. Um, but anyway, so I wrote stories forever and um, got into fan fiction because of Anne McCaffrey, that wily temptress. Um, she does that to one. Oh, my God. It's so, good. so I wrote fan fiction for a really long time. Um, and then when one of the people I wrote fan fiction with was Casey Uzel. Spoilers. That and one gets around, it's man. It's crazy. Um, um, we can tell a story about that in a little bit, too, because that was fun times. But anyway, so we did the story together. <laughs> there are potatoes behind me right now, guys. Um, and so when Casey, so as you guys know, because you've heard her show, um, when Casey decides something, Casey gets that shit done. Um, and so Casey decided, I think on one of her deployments, that she was going to be a published author. And then that shit happened. And it was amazing. And, and then, then now she decides things for other people. She, she also decides things for other people. So at one point she had this opportunity to write a novel and she's like, yeah, cool. But like one full-time helicopter pilot, two full-time mom, three, like have all these commitments. Here's my friend, Marisa. Can she write this novel with me? Um, and I was like, girl, I've never published anything. Casey's like, cool. Yeah, that's going to change. <laughs> and it did. So here we are. Speculative <laughs> fiction bringing us all together. So how did you meet um, Casey? So current fan fiction, um, I think we're in a couple of different clubs together. Um, for, so for folks that don't know how current fan fiction worked, um, 
started, I, it existed before me, obviously. Um, I came into it in the days of AOL, um, the little forums on AOL. Mm -hmm. um, and those spun off back to these play by email clubs. Um, and Casey and I ran a couple of them together. <clears throat> and then we started writing more and more together and just had a lot of fun writing. Um, and then at one point, I think after Assassin, which is our first co-written novel came out, um, we were at LibertyCon in Tony Weisskopf's room um, drinking beer and Todd McCaffrey walked in and Casey had already told Tony how she and I met. And so Tony, big smile on her face. Because says, she never does anything for mm -mm. just a random. Like, she goes, oh my gosh, Todd, how cool that you're here. Marisa, why don't you tell Todd how you became an author? Oh, that must have been great. <laughs> So fun and so embarrassing, which I mean, Tony is. Imaginous. Tony rolls with it very well, but it is kind of fun to embarrass Todd about his mom. He's so good. Yeah, no, it was really cute. And so I was like, we did burn fan fiction and we wrote it on the internet. Uh, and he was like, I love this. It's so good. Um, <laughs> so that was super fun. But anyway, that's how Casey and I met. And for, you, for you young kids that don't know, that was back when we actually sacrificed the immortal souls of robots to get on the internet. And it was it was torturous to listen to. Can you make that noise? Sacrifices. <laughs> I've done that for my kids because they didn't believe me like that. No, the internet is silent. No, really no, it's not. That's just because we killed all the robots. We killed them to get online. And now everyone has Wi-Fi. That's right. Their souls were, were used to strung along the cables to give us internet. That, that is how hotspots work. Those are their nexuses. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why sharks are always attacking the underwater cables because they're trying to free the souls of the dead robots. That makes, sense. that makes sense. Now, Sharknado makes so much more sense now. Right now, we know now. <laughs> and now we know why people love it so much. Science. That, that makes sense. Science. Science. Uh, I, I, I've told this to, to Terry Mixon, and I really think someone needs to up their game with the Sharknado, and we get Jelly Gator Nado. So, like, jellyfish and alligators in a tournament. You should write that, JR. Go write, write a screenplay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know great. anybody at sci fi. You know, they're too busy making moonshine run movies. So. <laughs> They forgot their way. This idea, they'll be all over it. I, I'm sure. I, I've put it out there in the ether, though. So, like now, the good vibes will just send it their way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've listened to a few hippies. That's totally how this works. That's definitely uh, right. So many authors let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. Um, were there any specific formidable moments that shaped you as a storyteller? Clearly, it's not getting headbutted by an alligator because you didn't write about it. You would think. You would think it would be. Um, I would say the thing that probably affects me the most is just people in general, like not people specifically. I'm not very good at like putting people I know in real life into the, into my stories. Um, but I am so interested in like the interactions between people. Um, I love watching them. I love figuring it out. I don't understand all the time <laughs> what's going on. Like I, I get the surface level of people, but like anything that is not what people present is a mystery to me. And so it's interesting to me to try to figure that out character wise. Um, I realized recently that all of my characters are in denial about something, usually their feelings. Um, that definitely doesn't say anything about me, though, so that's cool. And um, <laughs> it's denial is just a river in Egypt. It's, what, it's not even a real thing. It's just something that happens to fictional people, so it's okay. Um, science. But no, I would say like in general, so I was a teacher. I taught middle school. And man, if you want to watch how social interactions form middle school, is a place to do that. Um, I don't ever want to go back. Whew, it was, my kids were amazing, but it was, I was so grateful to be far away from my teen years. They are awful. Um, but, and the internet's just made them worse. I know, poor babies. Cause again, my kids were so great, but just having to watch what they went through. Anyway, so I'd say that kind of stuff tends to work in, like just how people figure out how to work with each other or not um, and, and deal with their own bullshit. So did you read Lord of the Flies and that's why you decided to become a middle school teacher? No, you know what though? Well, you know what's really fun is Lord of the Flies happened in real life. Like these kids from Thailand, maybe? Australia. Like, Australia, thank you. That's some island West. nation somewhere. Mid -east, mid -east, it's far. I believe. They got a boat. I don't know what cardinal direction that is. It's fine. They got a boat, they ended up in an island, and they didn't like it wasn't a Lord of the Flies situation. Like they were they were teenage boys and they worked together and they had like a tour chart and all this. And I, I find that fascinating, like how we imagine people will be versus how people tend to be. It's just really So the people that imagined that um, were city folk, not understanding that those were country folk who were used to that. So it was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, not much has changed. Okay. Right. So I, I think that makes a difference. 
I think I would uh, have liked the real one, but better than the fake one. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we would all prefer to live in, in that. And I, yeah, I think, and that's so interesting too, Jr. Because well, I think that oh, go ahead. in the army, you also see that a lot, where um, people who normally anywhere else probably wouldn't get along, but when you're stuck with each other mm -hmm. and that's what you have, you figure it out. That's a good point. That's a really good point. And that's the thing, too, I think a lot about. Like, like JR stuck with me. And that's, and you guys are figuring it out. Look at you. <laughs> Very Lord of the Flies-ish. Um, I just, I think about, like, different people with different cultural expectations, whether city or country or stuck together or you have a choice or whatever it is. Like, how things play <laughs> out is different. Margarita is not going to kill you. Yep. Please live. Okay. Um, it. And so when I write like alien races, it's really important to me for them to not be like early days Star Trek where like every alien of this kind of alien acts the exact same way. Like that's how they have to be because that's not how people are. Um, and I just find that really fascinating. So the real incident of the Lord of the Flies happened in 1977. I was totally wrong about the date. And the Australian boys landed on a Tonkin Island, but the book was written in 51. So he predicted the future. Except wrongly except it was badly done i mean it was it was interesting it was interesting right we have a lot of conversations about it but yes mostly so, about how much we hated it <laughs> right i like you know, the book i felt bad for piggy though I yeah oh, i piggy. feel bad for you you liked it it's a good got, book. Real. got real just then um i, I mean i it takes all kinds it, sure everyone's gonna like something i i find that when you're forced to read a book it's a whole different world than when you just like get to read it for fun like i was assigned the hobbit in 10th grade and you think that's right up my alley of course marissa would love that and i was like at this noise i'm not reading it who knows that's why. probably better than what i did to prelude to foundation which i chose and then had yeah. to write a book report on it mm. and then i wrote a book report on a book that the only commonality was the fact that i was writing a book report on it and it started the same because i didn't finish it and i <laughs> Yeah, my mother asked me exactly what I thought I'd been reading. Uh, not that book, something different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why I giggle anytime times people ask me if I've read uh, Foundation. I <laughs> did like the Foundation books. <laughs> if I've I ever read Isaac read Asimov, yeah. sort of. Well, so this is kind of a uh, perfectly timed set of questions because you're about to ask Doc the fandom questions to Marissa right mm -hmm. as you two are getting ready to go to this, this tiny little convention in Georgia called the uh, Dragon. Hey, hey, Dragon Dragon Con is on a diet this year. We're only forty-two thousand. Like, yeah, like that's that's just a couple of like ball, uh, ballrooms, right? Like you just get a couple people in a couple different rooms. You talk yeah. nerdy. Oh, we talk nerdy to each other all day. So talk nerdy, nerdy to me, baby. Me, baby. <laughs> all right, so you get to ask her if you're sober enough. You get to ask her the the nerd questions. I mean, the fandom questions. I am sober enough. I could be drunk off my batootie and be able to do that. We can talk fandom. We know what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. So, have you had anybody cosplay one of your characters in public? I have. It oh, was tell really us. Exciting. Um, a couple times. Uh, I also have my first fan tattoo, mm -hmm. which is kind of amazing. Um, okay, so cosplay, yes. Uh, I think it was a Liberty Con. Um, Brian Nad, aka Bubba. Aka, oh, I love Baba. Papa, he's amazing. Um, he dressed up as his character from Assassin uh, that Casey and I wrote in, which was really great. I think he was our first one. Um, and then I think also James Connison, who was a character, dressed up as well. So we've had a couple. Um, and then, like I said, we also have somebody who had the first tattoo, which is pretty. Now, cool. was was the tattoo of? So the tattoo is a quote from Hunter. Okay. Um, it's the uh, Depic. So Hunter, Assassin, and Hunter are about um, this race of alien assassins, cat assassins, they look like cats. Um, and so he got their paw print, which is a paw print, but with a thumb, because they are polydactyl, whatever, they have, they have thumbs. We um, have the fancy words now. That's right, polydactyl. I can still say it, so I'm not drunk, guys. I'm not drunk, you can measure this progress. I'm not gonna ask her if she can spell it, because I don't know how to spell it. Starts with a P, ends in a dull. So, um, we got it. so we got that. And the quote is, uh, better to live free than die a slave. Paraphrased from, from real world, I imagine. Uh, yeah. Thomas Paine, I believe, said something similar. I mean, a um, little bit, give me liberty, give me death, whatever, it's fine. Close enough, close enough. Um, you actually almost killed me with that story, no joke. So I was walking, and I was happy to be walking over a bridge in the lake behind my neighborhood, and when they had the little bell on the uh, on the human slave by the cat people, I started <laughs> laughing so hard I almost fell over. <laughs> and there was an alligator that tried to eat you. 
No, but there were some snapping turtles that are really kind of vicious, if you ask that me. They are. Snapping turtles are kind of scary and mean. I'm glad you lived. So, I'm really glad you lived. Thank, thank you, thank you, because we wouldn't be having this conversation. Or would we? I could be dead, and this could be a simulation. But you, you answered the uh, the tattoo. You're playing your Latin core math skills. And, and shut up. Uh, and we talked about the um, the mm-hmm. cosplay. Mm-hmm. But have you gotten any cool fan art? Like they've drawn pictures, like with little crowns or something, and sent them to you. Oh, that's a good question. No, not yet. Challenge out to the world. Hey, we could do that. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you been asked about signing something away from a convention? No. Okay. But the convention story is actually pretty fun. Okay, tell me the convention story. So at Fantasy this year, um, I was sitting chatting with some friends and Larry Korea was also at the table. He's really cool. It's the first time I'd ever really had a conversation with him. Um, JR thinks he's a midget. He's my favorite midget, no lie. The actual like six foot of 11, like I don't even, he's As I said, tall. he can't math. Okay, you can't math at all, no. Well, in my defense, when I met him the first time, he was sitting down, so it totally counts. So okay, no, it's fine. You're right. You're right. That'd be half. Anyway, so I'm sitting at a table, Larry Korea, and somebody came over with a book. And it's Larry Korea. He was like the guest of honor at this convention. And so Larry's like, oh, hey, man, like, go stick out his pen. And the guy's like, oh, actually, I'm not here for you. I'm here for her. <laughs> and he pointed at me. And I might have cried. I didn't cry, but in inside I was crying. Um, but I mean, in this guy's defense, he had already had like 80 things signed by Larry Korea because. No, Korea is amazing. Um, but I got to have a And moment. he'll sign about anything you hand him. He's so he's just he's so great. I knew he was great, and then I got to like actually talk to him as a human. And I was like, oh, you're even greater than I thought you were. That's really cool. But yep. also, how cool is it that I got to sign something while sitting at a table with Larry Korea? That's pretty fucking cool. So if he'll sign anything, I bet we could probably like do some sort of uh, dark ops and like, hey, no, this is totally you're just signing it as a fan. <clears throat> you just gave us everything in the will. <laughs> Actually, Mike messages that in um, <laughs> oh, Shadow of... Wait, wait. <laughs> sorry, before we get to that. But then you have to deal with Bridget, and you should not You should not be on the wrong side of Bridget Korea. So I think no dark eyes. I'm, I'm sure she's nice. She'll be fine. No, no, no. She's super nice. Don't fuck her over, though. <laughs> like, no. No. Mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. Because his fans are kind of rabid, but they're no oh, more... Yeah. But they're even more rabid when it comes to Bridget. Yeah, yeah, rightly so. Protect, protect the amazingness. She doesn't need protection because she's a badass, but protect the amazingness. All right, Doc, so, you're going to ask her to expand on a story about Mike Mazza. Oh yeah, no. tell the rest of that story. Oh what no, did he do no. So um, he's also a delight, guys. And his first Black Tide Rising novel, mm-hmm. he has his a specialist who is my favorite character of all time, nice. who goes up and takes all these paperwork to this shell shocked general who's just and, and has him sign it and she's like and there's a promotion orders and everything mm, else nice, in there. nice. he's a genius I mean, so they're like they're, they're, this guy's like I, I don't have the rank to do that and she's like you do now here you go yeah, here's you a do. copy of your promotion order okay bye as there's actually, zombie apocalypse is happening priority. the first time I met uh Casey I actually Mike Massa was there that that um, Moab bitches story, uh, Mike Mossman oh, yeah. was in there. Yeah, that, talk nice. about epic! My God, he is so cool. Also, very good singer. Um, karaoke at Liberty Con, right? Yes, I think. Um, his wife Lorna, also an amazing singer. Mike, amazing great dancer singer. too. Oh my God, she's so great. All these people, you guys, these people are so great. I can't get so, over it. But yeah, but yes, she's so yeah. drunk. She loves everybody. Me? No, even no, when I'm Lorna's sober, just that people. lovable. Lorna is wonderful. So. Mm-hmm. Now that we've had Lorna Fest and Bridget Fest, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, they're going to wonder what the, our fans are really going to wonder what the hell we're up to. <laughs> they're just going to say, "Oh, Doc's drunk again," and she's yeah, throwing other people. We're very innocent. I was on antibiotics for strep for ten days. I, I counted every moment. She has to get ready for Dragon Con, guys. I have to prep my liver. Yeah. Oh, you're pre gaming. Okay, okay. Pre gaming for four days. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. So have you have you seen anyone out in public reading your books? Mm. Yeah. So I mean, sure only, I <laughs> this is a good question. Um, only at con. Still very new. I'm still very new to this. And if they're reading an anthology you're in, but they're actually reading like the Larry Korea story, but you're also in it, totally counts. Okay. Totally still, does. still no, I don't think yet. No. no. That's fine. No. Could happen. It could. It will. It oh, will. You have some yeah. I have Just seen somebody uh, browse a book that I have a story in at a bookstore. 
So that's cool. That is awesome. So yeah. just just something Winder and I learned when we were still the sci-fi shenanigans. Apparently, if you're peeking in windows, though, the cops kind of frown on that. Oh. Elon Musk gets restraining orders. Okay. Wouldn't recommend it. Okay. No, so I, I'll stop. I mean, I've never done that. No, but we did have one author who said that he likes to uh, trash his books to make his fans defend the book. <laughs> oh, that was Larry like, Korea, right? No, no, it Bell? wasn't. It was Robert no. Ross. That's funny. I'm like, Robert, that's, that's kind of that's, messed up right That there. is a little messed up, but kind of funny, though. Clever. He's from Georgia. Where, the heat picture. Georgia, plays we, a little bit. <laughs> what are you going to do? Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so, and all that red clay. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that stains everything. <laughs> So, what would be your funniest fan interaction since you became a writer? My funniest fan interaction it was probably the the first time somebody, uh, this really cool woman um, who I hadn't met before, she came up to me and she's like, "I'm mad at you." And I was like, "I don't know you, but okay, this this seems likely. I, I do weird shit." Okay, she's like, <laughs> "You wrote a book, and it is so good. It is my." favorite book and you have no other books and I was like oh this is fun okay I thought this was mean but this is fun I can do Um, this like I had a whole moment where I was like I'm getting yelled at oh no this is delightful okay great Um, (laughs) and then she proceeded to rant for a very long time about how it's absurd that I would write such a great book which I wrote with Casey Um, but then I have no other books that she can go immediately find and buy and she's like if you do not have more books next year I will find you and I will shake you and I was like oh shit okay well, I don't think she actually was going to be violent. That's some Flora and Lessel level <laughs> shit right there. <laughs> Sorry, we don't shake people. But anyway, it was it was really funny. She was very kind. Um, and then she was like, I think you're going to be my favorite author. You're basically there, but I need more books. And I was like, okay. She needs a larger sampling I selection mean, she to She needs choose. to be sure. And that's, you know what, I respect that. That's fair. So. Has, have you seen her since? Um, yes, I have. Did you have more books? I have more books. I am making my way. I don't have enough <laughs> still to this day. 21 short stories is not enough. She needs more novels. So she's very clear about her needs. I respect that. Well, you know, she's communicating them That's clearly. Right. She's very clear about her boundaries. I respect that. So um, <laughs> give us kind of a highlight reel of what you worked on. Yeah. So the four horsemen, um, Casey and I have the cat assassins, the Depic hunters of the universe. Um, we are two of the six core authors, which is cool. I really enjoy the Four Horsemen universe. Um, I've also worked in Kevin Steverson's salvage title, um, Christopher. Which is hilarious. So much fun. It's very like classic space opera with a lot of humor in it, which I enjoy. I thought it was like junkyard romance. Oh my God. Junkyard space opera romance. That's kind of salvage yard. That's amazing. Have you told him that? No. You should write him a letter. These people need to know. That's amazing. Also got picked up for a movie, NBD, so it's going to be really cool. Salvage um, Yard, wasn't that Mark Wayne McGinnis wrote? He had the no. John Church Spaceship series. No, Ooh, it's a Kevin Steverson? Steverson, yeah. Hmm. Um, it's Salvage Title, Salvage Systems. And it's adorable salvage. that his, his son now writes it. I know, him. now his son writes it. He's really good. Um, so I've been in that. Chris Woods is Christopher Woods is Fallen World, um, which my first solo novel will be in that world, and that's coming out later this year. Um, I have done, like I said, 21 short stories, and those range from noir to fantasy noir, um, to urban fantasy to hard sci-fi. I say hard, hard sci-fi, but it's like a Wikipedia research. It's not really hard. Um, that's what she said. And um, <laughs> Multiple points in between. Um, and then um, in the next year or so, I should have some pure fantasy novels coming out. Um, and early next year, um, for those of you who might have heard of Larry Hoy and Bill Webb's Hit World, um, which is urban fantasy, where basically everything you've ever heard of is real interdimensional bleed between the worlds. Um assassin nation is legal like all this good stuff i'm gonna get to run a whole spin-off series of that um called hit world valkyries um and we've got this core of women authors who are going to be in it some people who i love are going to have to write short stories for it um i don't know what she's talking about no it's i'm just i really her. don't know what she's talking about I'm just why cutting her i haven't talked to her about it yet this is how i get Hi. her trapped on the camera <laughs> yeah um anyway so that will be out next year that will start next year um and it's gonna be pretty great Hit world so you, you've written what, what you called true fantasy and true sci-fi are you gonna write uh uh no as you said pure fantasy and pure sci-fi so will you be writing pure romance 
Um, I would love to, but I don't think I am clever enough. It needs to have magic I, I, or I dragons. Was, yeah, or, I'm like, it yeah. has to have some traits. Yeah. And window draping. Yeah, window draping. Yes, it has to be very. Or other, otherwise, trip. my pure romance would be like, hey, you want to go to the missile range? I met you. Oops. This is crazy. How did we? <laughs> Here's my number. So, so finger me. guns are the way to, to way to your heart. I'll, I'll take notes. All right. I mean, that's what I ask my husband. He does it on the regular. He's like, <laughs> it works. It works. It and works. Okay. Um, you have. Scribbling, scribbling that in my little notebook. <laughs> I'm not so, sure I've uh, seen grown straight men do it quite as often. Well, I mean, <laughs> we don't ask and, and he doesn't have to tell. Yeah, so he, no, today no, we are going to be conducting what I thought would be a brief episode, but it turns out that Drunk Saska does nothing quickly. Uh, but we're going to dive into the world of thoroughly. Right. You're right. and short stories. So we're going to interview Marissa, yep. not yep. Mel, I got that wrong, about the undervalued world of short content, specifically her... Uh, anthology Starflight Tales from yeah. the Starport. Did, did. This was a great episode. So, yeah. whoa, the glorious Ooh, cover. Look at that sexy cover. It's so beautiful. But, but it's it's it breaks the rules because it's not spaceship ass, it's spaceship head. No, that doesn't right. work. Hey, hey, not everything has to be ass. Sometimes the head is just as good. We're gonna save ourselves from that anthology because it's going nowhere good quickly. And we don't want to go. Uh, it's an analogy, right. not an anthology. It's going everywhere, good friends. We're here to talk about Starflight. Uh -huh, let's do it. All right, so Tales let's see what this Starport Lounge. Let's see what that's all about. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to try my movie trailer voice. Clearly, you're about to find out why I don't have his job. But I'm ready. 17 <laughs> incredible authors, 17 amazing stories, one fantastic science fiction universe where the only limit is one's imagination. Welcome to Starflight. Based on the exploration-based Starflight video game series created by Greg Johnson and the Binary Systems team, the stories in Tales from the Starport Lounge flesh out and shine a light into the darkest corners of the known universe. Join the last vestiges of humanity and their alien allies, the reptilian Thorin, the insectoid Velox, and the plant-based Elowan. As they attempt to carve out their own territory in a sector of space filled with the wondrous opportunity and deadliest threats, brave explorers seek out new worlds to colonize while merchants cruise from the starport to starport, their holds laden with exotic goods. Not all in this futuristic setting have noble intent. For every prospector and trader attempting to make a difference, a dozen pirates, smugglers, and mobsters engage in all manner of criminal enterprise. Gangs fill the underbellies of every major city and made the trade routes between stars, pushing out the outnumbered and outgunned interstellar police to their limit and forcing civilians to make to take matters into their own hands. It is a rough and tumble universe where one wrong move could spell doom for an expedition or grant yeah. enough wealth to buy a planet. Board your ship and set your course for the stars unknown. The universe awaits. Awaits. That's great. Uh, yeah, I don't have his job yet, but one day I'm going to keep practicing. Well, in a world. Nick does a much better job of trying to oh, no. <laughs> this. He does everything is, um, what's that guy's name? Um, Jack Nielsen. Mm. He, That's he his movie trailer voices. He just does Jack Nielsen. Yeah. Like yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You now, when he can do James Earl Jones, then we talk. He doesn't have a lot of variety, but he does do he one does voice very really well. well. That's legit. I can't do any of that. He may be our one no. trick voice pony. <laughs> there were things. Good thing he it. draws real purdy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He does draw real purdy. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. all right, Marissa, uh, you got to ask Marissa the next question if you're sober enough. What you was your? This? I am sober. <laughs> so judgy. Things are happening. Mm -hmm. I know. So what was your story type? Obligations. Oh, and what is obligations about? Can you give us a quick synopsis of your short story? Correct. Yes. I don't know why I said correct. Yes, I can. Because um, <laughs> I am correct. You are correct always yes. at all times. Everyone should know that. It's important. Um, so the synopsis of this story, this is like drunk history, but <laughs> interviewing guests. Like as I just get slightly more tipsy throughout the course. It's kind of great. I'm gonna tell you about night. No, anyway, okay. Um, so <laughs> obligations is about a woman who worked for Interstellar, which is the like interstellar corp of cops. Um, corp is not a word. It's fine. It is a word. Corp. Marine Corps. Not corp. No, yeah. Not no. Marine Corps. Corp is, corp corp is, is a dead body. <laughs> Correct. She doesn't work for dead bodies. She works for the corp. It's fine. Interstellar. Interstellar. It's fine. She works for them. Um, but then her dad dies, 
And so in order to save his ship and his crew from being repossessed, she has to leave her job, which she really likes, um, and take over the ship. And the whole crew hates her. And she can't figure out why, because she loved her dad. Her dad loved her. Um, and so the story is her figuring out what the world looks like when you don't have a cushy job at Interstell um, and how her crew has been making things work. Oh, my. Oh, my. It's a, it's a little bit of a, like, forming a reluctant found family, which is my dream. So the uh, Interstell, I'm guessing, is a play on Interpol, which is the International Police Organization oh. here globally on terra firma. We would have to ask Greg Gunson, but yes, I would. I think that's a fair assumption. I, I mean, I'm sure I can speak for him, having never met or heard about him, but I'm sure I can totally speak for him. So I was on a podcast with him um, through the the pub, Three Ribbons Publishing, which did Starflight. He is a delight. Did you guys ever play Toe Jam and Earl? No, never heard of it. No. Ugh, ugh, whatever. He. Also, I think I, as a medic, I uh, generously avoided the phrase Toe life. Jam. Okay. <laughs> Okay, fair. Um, but he's a game designer. So Greg Johnson is a game designer. He designed um, Starflight, which influenced Star Control, um, Halo, a bunch of other games that came later. Um, and he also worked on this fun game. Anyway, you don't know it. It's fine. But maybe some of your listeners do because they're cool. And they are probably <laughs> cooler than us. They're pretty cool. Um, and anyway, he's great. We had a podcast with him. He showed us a tour of his house. I don't know what the point of this was, but you could totally ask him because he shares his email. That was the point of this segue. I'm going to keep drinking. Carry on. <laughs> All right. So what was the inspiration for this short story besides booze? <sighs> booze does play a part in this story. Booze I'm is pretty shocked. much how everything gets done in the world. Correct. I am shocked to share that I'm with you. pretty sure 99% um, of the human population here is because of it. <laughs> what do humans inevitably invent from culture to culture? Booze, carbs, and housing. Okay, great. Um, that's real. I didn't actually make and that pants. up. Pants. And pants. Mm, not necessarily. Some have like just like kilts. No, but before kilts were a thing, people, they wore pants. Oh, who knew? They went kilts and wore kilts. Pants. Jeez. What? Wait, what? You wore loincloths. It's okay. It's fine. Just cover the important bits. Um, semi important bits. Anyway, uh, the the inspiration for the story, I really, really love found family stories. Like, I really do. So, like, I love obviously Firefly, Killjoys, Dark Matter, like anything that you've got a group of people coming together. Like Seska said, sometimes, like, despite their best interests, like in the army, like these might not be people who would actually hang out, but then they're put into a situation where they have to spend time together. I love that. So, one of the inspirations for the story was that. And then it also became a different story while I was writing it. So I had it all planned out, felt really good about myself. I was like, I got an outline, I'm writing a story, it's great. And then I got to the end and I was like, God damn it, this is a different story than I thought it was. And I had to go back and rewrite the entire middle part <laughs> because <laughs> things happened that I was not expecting because my characters are jerks. So, yep, characters can do that sometimes. They really can. So normally we would ask you if your story fits into a larger universe, but since we kind of know that already, given mm -hmm. the, um, the blurb, instead, sure. what drew you to the expansive universe Mr. Uh, Big Johnson created? Did you call him Big Johnson just now? Yes, mm -hmm. I did. That was amazing. That was awesome. That was really great. Um, so Starflight, I apparently, I apparently played when I was like eight. Um. <laughs> Sorry, we have special guests. Who just distracted me because they're adorable and I love them. Tell them about Big Johnson. <laughs> Big Johnson. So anyway, so I played Starflight when I was young. <laughs> My dad had the game. It was the first computer game I ever played. Um, what I really, really liked about it then, it was one of the first open-ended mm -hmm. RPG games, like sandbox, open sandbox, computer games. <laughs> Um, there's a lot happening behind me, guys, not just potatoes, but just things are happening. It's fine. Um, Anyway, it's a really cool open world, and I love that, right? Like, it's why I love 4 h and Salvage System and Fallen World. Like, it's just, it's an actual universe that feels like things are happening beyond whatever the main story is. Like, it's a real world that's lived in and you can play in. Um, and when I was, like, eight or nine, it was pretty cool. I wrote very elaborate backstories for my characters. <laughs> were any more potatoes involved? There were not. But maybe there should have been. Um, but I kept it in my Trapper Keeper. Um, I didn't actually need it for the game, but... You know, Trapper Keeper notes were really important to eight-year-old Marisa in the 80s. And, um, yeah, so I really love the game. So I forgot entirely about it because I discovered Cam uh, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, like a little bit after that. 
um, and became obsessed with that because trivia and Carmen San Diego and it was delightful. The um, reboot's pretty awesome too. I know, and there was a cartoon. It's amazing. Um, but anyway, so um, when uh, Three Ravens Publishing got the contract with Starflight, I was like, wait, wait, this game is familiar. I played this game, and so I was so excited to get to write a story for it. It was pretty cool. So was the Trapper Keeper one of the Liz Franks, I think? Or did I'm you pretty sure it was the Lisa Frank Trapper Keeper. Oh. Yeah. They were probably unicorns and dolphins. I really liked her dolphins. Psychedelic kitties. Yes, probably. Probably. They Anything could have been possible. Um, it was the 80s. So can you give us a Reader's Digest of the Universe? Mm. Yes, it's the future. Earth is gone. Um in the game, uh, there is something that is slowly blowing up suns in civilized and um, settled systems. So it's, it's called like, rolling a one. <laughs> yeah, it's bad times. Um, a lot of genocide happening. You got to figure out why all these suns are blowing up and what's happening. Um, so in the anthology, it is like it's a universe. It's a galaxy system um, on the edge. Like you're not. There's been a lot of war. There's been a lot of conflict between different races. Everybody wants something different. No race is a monolith, so there are a bunch of different humans. Like some want to find their homeland of Earth, some just want to like move forward, some want to make alliances with aliens. Um, it's really cool. The anthology itself, you've got stories that are pretty solidly noir. You've got mill sci-fi. You've got some that are a little bit space opera y. Um, so I think the stuff. biggest question oh, that yeah. I have and yeah. the listeners would have mm -hmm. is: Do you have to be familiar with the Starflight universe? in order to engage in this book and enjoy it? It's a great question. And the answer is absolutely not. Um, you could you could just pick it up and start reading So this it. is a great gateway drug. It is a gateway drug. We're good at that. First hit's free, because you can get the 10% sample on Amazon. There you go. Look at that, JR, great sales. I do what it's I can. So, so um, what genres of science, well, you actually said what some of the genres that were in there. But uh, what is your genre in? So what was your short story genre? Because I know you're uh, very genre fluid. I am genre fluid. Um, I mean, when I went into it, I meant for it to be a little cyberpunky, um, because it is like Interstellar's the corporation and they're working against it and like stuff is happening. But it just it turned a little bit sci-fi murder mystery. Ooh, like something happened and they have to figure out why. So, does your genre fluid thing have a flag? Because I think everyone needs a flag. Would it be no. like a dragon for sci-fi uh, for fantasy and like a sun for sci-fi and like a, a dragon in a spaceship? That sounds a lot like the Bane logo. <laughs> I know. I mean, I love Bane. What are you gonna do? Like, so, so yeah, basically, it is the Bane logo is your gender fluid flag. Okay. I think you're right. Yeah, I think that's that's basically. I did just get a I new dare logo. I you to though. tell Tony okay. that she might enjoy. Well, that. you know, I'm sure Tony listens to this podcast, so she's like. Oh, JR, he knows what's up. He's on to our plan to take over the world. He knows. They're going to take over the world. They're amazing. Um, oh, all right. So yeah. your your story um, obligations, um, yeah. do you think you're going to write a sequel to it, or is this a one and done kind of story? That is a really good bam, bam, thank you, man. Really good question. I, want I mean, Sometimes it just be like that, Doc. It'd be like that. Sometimes I... No, not sometimes. Do you want to? I 100% want to. The list of projects that I have, what did you say I had, JR? Project ADD? Yeah, it's ADHD. Yeah. ADHD. ADHD, you're right. Oh, it's definitely ADHD. There's an H in there. Um, so the list of projects that I have is absurd for the next year, which is an amazing problem to have. I feel great about it. And part of why I'm living in an RV currently is so I can write more and work less. Because that way you have, you know, no yard work. Correct. Less chores. It's a very small space. You clean it real fast. Um, and much less overhead for money. So contract work and writing handles my shit right now. Um, so yes, I very much want to write a novel. Um, Scott, uh, who runs the publishing company, is hoping to have more stories in the universe. So if he came to you with a contract, you'd say yes if you so work has, with me on the timing of it. He has said to us, who wrote in the anthology, that he would love for us to make more stories. Um, I am not ready to ask for a contract yet because I need to get a bunch of stuff off my plate first. But yeah, I'm hoping there'll be more in like two years, 2023. So, so what brought it about that they were going to make this um, into an anthology? Because the game's not around anymore, is it? No, they had a Kickstarter. It wasn't a Kickstarter. It was some other brand name Kickstarter. I don't know. Indiegogo, um, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I don't actually, I don't know. But it was something. Crowdfunding. Um, it was some sort of crowdfunding approach to make a Starflight 
three because there is a Starflight two. This is the Margarita's talking right now. I don't remember. Some new sequel of it. And it got really close. Um, and there were a bunch of people who were super into it, including um, the guy who played, who wrote Ready Player One. Um, like there are a bunch of people who are super into that idea because Starflight, again, it really was, influenced the genre. Yeah, it really influenced the genre. Like it has a huge part to play. Um, and so it got really close and Scott got really excited. Again, the, the guy who runs uh, three, three Ravens Publishing and also writes, he's great. Um, and so he got really into it. He reached out to Greg and was like, hey, do you guys have like tie-in novels? Is that a thing you do? Um, and they had never contracted it before, but they decided to because they liked what he had to say. He loved the game. Um, and so he put together the anthology and is is the, the tie-in guy. So how did you get hooked up with this? I mean, did they like find you in a flop house for gender fluid drug addicts? And I mean, you know, I just yeah, love it. I just like fluid. hang out in chat rooms. Like, it, there goes my joke. I apologize for everyone I offended, but I was trying to be funny. And we were trying defense, to be funny, and it's so gender. It's genre fluid. My, in my defense, I am on my second bourbon. There you go. There you go. My my drink is very big and very. very I love empty. you. You're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> my liver <laughs> doesn't. You're innocent. And Everybody dies right. eventually. Yeah, my liver is like That's you're not twenty one anymore. <laughs> Wow. All right, so save this from ourselves. Like, how did you get hooked up with this anthology? Yeah, yeah. save this, Marissa. I can't save you because I just want to go down this path of dirtiness and jokes. Um. <laughs> anyway, you're welcome. She just passed Margarita through her nose, and that's rough gets to kill a bird. Don't worry. Someone will – never mind. <laughs> no. It's going to be great. I was going to make a mouth-to-mouth -mouth Heimlich maneuver joke, but then I realized this was – we're, we're trying to stay um, in the family-friendly zone. Right. Maybe. Um, the, the real answer is Scott just reached out and asked if I wanted to do it, and I said, hell yes, which is always my answer. Even when I have said I have to stop writing short stories and get some novels out, when somebody <laughs> asks me about a cool project, I'm like, Yes, I'm supposed to say no, but yes, just popped right out. So consent. So matters. I got an anthology coming up, and we'll, we'll talk offline. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. This happened. I was on another podcast, and one of my writer friends was like, "Oh yeah, I'm doing this anthology in December," and I was like, "No, I have to say no, but also send me the details." <laughs> Why am I like this? I don't know. It's you're you can stop at any time. I can't. I literally can't, guys. I can't. <laughs> Okay. All right, so we, we have a cool one for the road. We've, we've kept you um, from fully imbibing for almost an hour now. So uh, if you could live in this world, would you? Oh, shit. I don't know. I think that about, like, all of my science fiction and fantasy places. I mean, at the end of the day, I really, really just want to live in Fern, even though, like, Fred would probably eat me on my second day. Um, but you'd have none weed, and that's okay, right? And like, I'd have a dragon though, and that'd be no. cool. So, anyway, would I live in the Starflight universe? Um, maybe, but my answer for this is always like, if I had a fuck ton of resources, so like, if I had my own ship with unlimited fuel, because guys, I don't know if anybody listening or here hosting has played this game, but the number of times that I hit game over because I ran out of fuel is. A lot. It's a lot. It's the more than high. you want to know. It's more. I probably couldn't count that. We're high not going to admit to that number. Yeah, I don't. I was eight, so it was probably like plus hundred. I don't know. It was more than I thought. And that's where I save points. It is. <laughs> <laughs> There's an unspoken rule of, of intergender dynamic, but you're not supposed to ask a girl how many times she died in the video game. Okay. Good. Good. Good to know. Really. I didn't know that rule. I didn't know that people rule. People definitely asked me that. Goldeneye was a thing when I was in college, and I loved playing it, and people definitely asked me a lot. And I'm like, I remember the original Halo LAN party. I just always smiled at them. Yeah, he was like, I talk about now. I played like 800 times last night. So. I'm like, <laughs> you want a multiplayer of this shit? I'm going to shoot you with the PP7. All right, go. <clears throat> PP5? All that? right. So okay, if yeah, you have resources back. and plot armor, you're totally down for living in this world. Yes, give me the plot armor, and I will be in the universe. <laughs> all, right, all right. So what are you going to name your spaceship? Ooh, the wolf's paw. Nice. Thank you. I like Not that. the cat's assin? <laughs> Not the cat. No, because ass is in there and people would make jokes. Mm, this, this they is already have been made. With the last name, like, <laughs> you almost kind of have. Oh, I broke her. I broke her. All right, Marissa, before you this pass out. we hang out so well together. I'm sorry. She's busy. Before you die, and, and your husband has to take your corpse to the no, detox the thing. I'm, I'm no, a follower, but I almost fit just then. <laughs> he has a medic on call. 
Right, that, that's the question. Cool. What? Hi. Uh, so before before we lose you to the sauce, um, can you tell us how they can find you on the wild, wild interwebs? The wild, wild interwebs where you no longer have to kill a robot to hang out. Um, you can find me at Instagram at book dogs, um, book as in books that you read and dogs as in my favorite animal, um, or my website, which is mariswolf.net or mariswolf.com because I bought all the things. So whichever you'd like. Hey, um, good shopping. Sweet. Yeah, those are the best places. I also have a... Facebook author page that I don't remember a lot because Facebook and that is Maurice Wolf author on Facebook and that's probably the best place on Twitter. I'm just mean and I retweet lots of mean things. So avoid me on Twitter, but come find me on Instagram. It's fun. I never know what I'm doing on Twitter. I'm just being mean. That's fine. I forget that I have a Twitter until people are like, Hey, do you author have a Twitter? I'm like, we scroll through and then I, yeah, maybe don't find me there. To my, my came to fame before I closed my Twitter because I realized I was going places that I didn't want my business branding to go was I got blocked by George R. R. Martin. Oh my god, that's amazing. Did you did you ask for a book? What did you do? No, so probably made a comment talking, about how long it takes him to write a book. He was talking politics and getting really sanctimonious. I'm like, dude, you write about rape and incest and dragons. Like, get off your high horse and just enjoy life. It's too short. And then he blocked me. You said just enjoy life. You didn't even say go write a fucking book. Come on, man. No, just just enjoy life. Life's too short, you know. Life is too short. You you suck at nagging. I would totally get blocked would, by that for nagging. Well, I, would too. I don't just ask Nick. I nag him. Where's my book? Where's my story? Where's my pictures? So I don't really get into grim dark. So his, his books are not my thing. And I knew before I would have gotten to read them that like he just killed I everybody. Mean, I don't like rapey. Rapey should not be a thing. I don't like rapey. And whenever a book is described as rapey, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, out. I'm done. I did. I will tag like, out. Not at all a spoiler. So the Fallen World book that I'm writing, one of the things I really liked about Fallen World, um, Chris Woods and Chris Kennedy, they did not write a lot of like women are always in danger of being raped, which I appreciate because I'm so exhausted by that. Um, can guarantee you that my book will have zero, well, zero danger I mean, of rape. If you've met Chris's wife or sister, you understand that they are much more likely to kill somebody That's who touches true. them or looks Lots at them of wrong. Lots swords and weapons, which I respect. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even put in the naughty bits because yeah. uh, my mom is one of my editors, and it's just nice. the first time I tried that to set something up for later. She like sent it back, and she's like, "I don't know what you and your wife are doing, but go practice and then rewrite this." And, and now he has two children. Me. Now I have two children, and it was just—it's all over now. I'm just never writing that stuff again. It scarred me for life, yeah, but. I mean, you can find <laughs> us on our website. Look, when you're hey, mad. hey, hey, behave. What? It's not my fault. You're the one who told, brought it up. You can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tacking and tech blades. Again, that's anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. On Twitter, we're SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. I guess, I guess you guys are going to have a hard time knowing that that SF actually stood for sci fi and fantasy show. Oh, but. Weird. In case you didn't know that, um, yeah, that's out there for you. So you can email us at blastersandbladespodcast at gmail.com. We promise we do answer it. Send all the hate mail to Suska at blastersandblades.com. <laughs> hey, um, hey, don't do that. I could, have, it could not be a hate mail. I could get compliments. You never know. It's been known to happen. Again. And I could give out real addresses. Blastersandbladespodcast at gmail is real, though. I promise. We've actually gotten hate mail there. Uh, we, Send love. We, we have a Facebook group. It's facebook.com backslash groups with an S. Groups, plural. <laughs> like it. It's important. Backslash groups, backslash blasters and blades podcast where all the cool shenanigans happens. And uh, Saskia routinely drunk texts uh, to the world. So, you know, it's a thing. Uh, she, she also bugs uh, Nick Garber about uh, his day job getting in the way of his comic book making and I something do. about owing her art. Yeah, I do. I tell him, stop yeah. drawing other people's art. Draw yeah. my art. <laughs> he, has a, he has a problem where he draws lots of Marvel art. And I don't know how the law is no, about selling that, but he's no. an effigy art. It's for Marvel, not for him. Neil gives me no money. did say years ago that, you know, X author is not your bitch. But it sounds like Nick is not your bitch. No, okay, he totally is. Friends. Totally not. I am not Nick. that one. Nice to you. <laughs> he's mine. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So you can support the show. Uh, at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. <laughs> buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section for this podcast. And if you want now after today's episode to specially tag an episode to uh, or the funding to go to um, Nick's therapy fund after he was totally eviscerated by uh, Marissa and uh, Doc, you With know, love. that's a thing. And we'll make sure. But love. otherwise, if you put it in the for, it's for the podcast, I promise I will keep Doc's <laughs> 
duly intoxicated, they will drink until their liver surrenders. There's just one very large drink, guys. It's fine. It's okay. She can stop at any time. All right. And you can also support us on a reoccurring mo- uh, monthly basis yeah. over at anchor.fm backslash blasters mm-hmm. and blades. Oh, you got to put the dashes in there too. Backslash blasters dash and dash blades. We've totally done this before. And I promise I'm not even drunk. I was actually joking. It's but just Diet Coke. Three inch. Just the females. The females. Yeah. I got to do the like sober driving for the podcast. Because oh. when all three of us were drunk, it was a thing and it was bad and. It was a very entertaining thing. It's drunk for everyone, but you know, Walt, who called and gave yeah. Nick and I like hate mail. So, oh. <laughs> Grandpa Walt busted them and then told me I was wonderful and perfect. Oh, okay, well that's fine then. That's lovely. That's why he's grandpa. She was Walt. drunk enough that she was clapping and doing <laughs> and pointing her fingers <laughs> and knife handing everybody. Finger, you're knife handing. But but she wasn't she wasn't so drunk that she gave the finger gun. So I guess it was acceptable. I don't know. All right, Doc, bring the show home. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For the um, comic drawing, Nick Garber, who from Apogee Comics, will be drawing me more stuff from Apogee Comics and the overworked, highly tolerant JR. I'm Seska. This is Marissa Wolf. And this was the Blasters and Blades Contact Podcast. Join us next time where we promise we somewhat entertaining yes, yes totally. we had promised to be somewhat sober and more entertaining maybe um we <laughs> oh, where we enjoy and then we hi elvis we love you too uh we indulge in our love of nerd culture cheesy jokes good booze and all things that go boom cheers it sounded like you said something other than booze but on that note we will end it. we like boobs too mm. Yes. Yeah, All right. Have, okay. Well, since you went there, we've got one more important yeah. question for you, Marissa. All right, oh, this yeah. is going to decide whether we can air this episode. Pineapple on okay. pizza, yay or nay? Wait, what did you say? Apple on pizza, yay. Apple on pizza? No, pineapple. Pineapple. On pizza. pineapple. Pineapple on pizza. Nay. I actually heard apple on pizza the first time you said it. <laughs> that would be I weird. Apple. I have had apple on pizza. It was like, no, I have not. I've had pear on pizza. So huh. pear, gorgonzola, and something else. And it was I, just I totally yeah, that would so be amazing. We had this little pizza place here called CC's. Hey, welcome to CC's. And they do have a dessert pizza that has apple on it. It's like an apple cobbler pizza. I would try mm. that. Yeah, dessert pizza. But it's, it's a different kind of crust. It's more like um, cinnamon roll bread crust. So I don't know if you really could call it a pizza. I never eat at CC's. It went in and it smelled weird. <laughs> Mm-hmm. They, did they say it to you? <laughs> hey, did they go, it. If it, it smells, smells weird, weird. Not, don't eat it. It's not going in my mouth. What? That's solid advice.